chance. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I Is that mean? I think it's your list. Is that mean? Second Main Okay, I'll get started. Last class was a first class on relativity and actually this class is our second and last class on relativity. Uh, next week we'll move on to quantum physics and quantum world. In the last class we introduced the, the foundations of relativity and we developed the idea of time dilation and length contraction in relativity. So a new understanding of uh, spatial intervals and time intervals in relativity. Uh, we're going to build on that in today's class. Uh, and as we build on that in today's class, we're going to talk about these topics. These are going to be our objectives. I want to talk about um, how you add velocities together in relativity and a consequence of how you add velocities together in relativity is that unlike classical space-time, in relativistic space-time, there's a maximum speed. There's a speed limit, speed of light. I want to talk about the laws of motion in relativity. We talked about the laws of motion in um, Newtonian space-time. Now we're going to talk about them in relativistic space-time. And in particular, we're going to focus on energy and momentum in relativistic space-time. And we're going to look at some examples, illustrations of energy and momentum in, in relativistic space-time. This is where we're going to meet the, you know, the most famous physics equation of E equals mc squared. I mean, if I can, if I can move the slide. OK. So I wanted to just begin because the whole of today's class is, is building on this. I, I wanted to just begin with a reminder last class. Um, we said that the foundations of relativity were the fact that the laws of physics are the same in all frames of reference for all observers in all frames of reference. And we also said that the speed of light is the same in all frames of reference, for all observers in all frames of reference. So the whole of relativity is, is based on those two statements, those two postulates. They led to two strange, bizarre, peculiar consequences. One is to do with the measurement of time intervals, and the second is to do with the measurement of distance intervals. We might call the time intervals one uh, durations, measuring durations, and the distance, individual, distance intervals one, measuring lengths. What we discovered is that unlike in classical space-time, in relativistic space-time, uh, different observers in different uh, different observers in different reference frames, uh, in general, disagree on the duration, the time interval between two events, and they also disagree on the length, the distance interval between two events. Uh, and these features are known as time dilation. They're known as uh, length contraction. You measure the proper time if the time time interval if the uh, initial time and final time are at the same locations in your reference frame. That's the proper time. Uh, you measure the proper length if the, uh, the, the distance interval, the length, is at, at rest in your reference frame. That's the, the proper length. Otherwise, you're going to measure a uh, dilated time and you're going to measure a contracted time. If a clock is moving past you or a meter stick is moving past you, you're going to measure the dilated time or the uh, con contracted length. These are the ingredients that tell us how space-time 
transforms between reference frames in relativity and how it transforms differently from space-time in classical physics. And these are the ingredients we need uh, to, in this, this class, understand uh, the nature of relativistic motion or relativistic speed, understand the nature of relativistic energy, and understand the nature of relativistic momentum. So that's our, that's our goals. OK, so first topic I want to talk about is adding together velocities uh, and a maximum velocity, the speed of light. Adding together velocities is like, um, imagine, imagine I'm on a train uh, and I'm walking along the coach of a train. My motion with respect to a person, pedestrian on the platform, is the addition of the train's motion along the tracks past the platform and my motion along the coach of the train. I would just add together those two velocities and that's how the pedestrian on the platform would see me uh, moving as I, I walked along uh, the coach in the moving train. So that's an example of uh, addition of velocities. How does that work in relativity? We're going to see that. The way we're going to see it is I'm going to show you two slides here. The first slide is from sort of the classical space-time perspective, the common sense perspective of how we add together velocities. The second slide that I'll then go to is um, the relativistic space-time perspective and the not common sense way you add together velocities in relativistic space-time. So we're going to start with um, common sense, everyday addition of velocities and move to um, uh, not common sense, relativistic addition of velocities. So let's take a look at this picture. Um, it's quite a busy picture. I've got two frames of reference in this picture. And I've denoted them by different colors. The, the green and the black here are the two frames of reference. Um, one frame of reference is the pedestrian frame of reference, so here's the pedestrian. The pedestrian is stationary in the pedestrian frame of reference. And the second frame of reference is the truck frame of reference. So here's the um, truck frame of reference and the driver and the passenger uh, stationary in that frame of reference. And as usual, I've denoted the frames of reference with these little cartoons to represent space and time in the two frames of reference. Again, I can only draw one spatial dimension, I can't draw all three. So here's the uh, reference frame for the pedestrian, horizontally the position, vertically time. Here's the reference frame for the uh, passenger and the driver, uh, here's horizontally position, uh, vertically time. And I'm, I'm using these X and T's and X primes and T primes to denote, uh, to label the positions and times in those frames. In addition, I've drawn a little bird. The bird is flying through the air. And the pedestrian is observing the bird and the bird's motion. And the uh, uh, driver and passenger are observing the bird and the bird's motion. So we got two pairs of observers in two different frames observing the motion of the bird. As the bird flows, flows, fl flies left to right, the pedestrian is observing the bird and seeing the bird move with some velocity I've called it V subscript X, and I've written it in blue. And so I'm going to denote the um, bird's velocity as seen by the pedestrian with a, 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 a V for velocity, um, a X, because that's the dimension that we're imagining it moving in. And I'm going to uh, denote it as blue, because that's how I'm going to refer to the um, uh, pedestrian reference frame. I've denoted also the velocity that the driver and the passenger see the bird moving it with. That's this Vx prime here. It's in green. And I'm going to use green to denote the um, velocity of the bird as seen by the, the, the passenger. And of course, they both see the bird moving with respect to their reference frames, the passenger reference frame, the uh, pedestrian reference frame, at, di at different speeds, right? That's common, obvious com common sense. You know, if the um, truck is driving 
at 10 miles an hour with respect to the, the, the pavement. If the bird is flying at 20 miles an hour with respect to the pavement, then the, the pedestrian on the pavement would see the bird flying at 20 miles per hour. The driver in the truck would see the bird moving at just 10 miles an hour. So they would see different velocities. Finally, I've added in black here one more important velocity. I've, I've denoted that as V subscript R, and I'm going to write that in black. Um, that's the velocity of the truck as it moves through the pedestrian reference frame, or it could be the velocity of the pedestrian reference frame as it moves through the truck reference frame. I've drawn the picture here from the perspective of the pedestrian reference frame. So in this particular picture, the pedestrian reference frame is stationary, the truck reference frame is moving. This equation here, which represents, right, really common sense, it's really just obvious to us, the relationship between the mathematical relationship between the velocity of the bird as seen by the pedestrian, that's seen in blue here, the and the velocity of the bird as seen by the driver or the pa passenger, that's in, that's in green here. And the relationship depends on how the passenger and driver are moving with respect to the pedestrian, how the two frames are moving with respect to one another, and that's the V subscript R here. So in my little example, if the bird was flying at 20 miles per hour, left to right, with respect to the pavement, then blue VX is 20 miles an hour. Uh, if the um, truck is moving at 10 miles an hour, left to right, with respect to the pavement, then VR is 10 miles an hour. Then uh, this equation here would tell you that the uh, passenger or driver of the truck would see the bird moving with a velocity, that's the uh, green VX prime, that is 20 minus 10, that is 10 miles an hour. And so that's just an embodiment of the common sense relative motion of the bird with respect to the truck, with respect to the uh, pavement or pedestrian. Okay. This is the same slide the same picture, but instead of the classical space-time and the classical transformation between the two frames, this is the relativistic space-time and the relativistic transformation between the two frames. Look, if the picture is exactly the same. I still got the pedestrian reference frame denoted in, in blue here. I've got the truck reference frame denoted in green here. Uh, the truck reference frame is still moving with respect to the pedestrian frame or vice versa. They're still both looking at the birdie. Uh, the birdie is seen to be moving with uh, speed blue VX from the pedestrian frame, speed uh, green VX prime from the uh, truck frame. But what's different? The only thing I changed on this slide actually is that I rewritten the relationship between the speed of the bird seen by the passenger or the driver of the truck uh, and the speed of the bird as seen by the pedestrian. It's this equation here, this more complicated equation. And this is how you transform speeds from one frame to another frame in relativity. The first half of it, this piece here that I'm circling cleverly with the laser pointer, um, that's just the Galilean transformation, that um, Vx prime is equal to Vx minus the speed of the truck in the pedestrian reference frame, the, minus the Vr. But I'm dividing by some extra factor here. So this is the extra source, the extra ingredient in relativity, the fact that I'm going to divide by this factor here. So this is the, the weirdness, this is the peculiarity that I can't say in, in, in relativity. Um, what does this do? Let's just think about what this does. Well, suppose firstly, if I was, uh, 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 if the truck was traveling at everyday speeds, the bird is traveling at everyday speeds, everything's everyday speeds, everything's everyday life, then the V, the VX, the VR, 
the Vx prime, they're all much smaller than the speed of light in our everyday life, in our everyday world. That means that this little piece here that I'm subtracting off the one, that's completely negligible at everyday velocities, which means that this division is just a division by one, which means that we just have the regular old common sense Galilean transformations between reference frames. So it do, at everyday speeds, everyday velocities, it does look like common sense transformations between reference frames. Um, at high speeds, high speeds meaning of order the speed of light, approaching the speed of light, that are not negligible compared to the speed of light, though the transformation of velocities from one reference frame to another reference frame changes. And it's, it changes in a way that's all determined by this little piece here. And it's actually this little piece, this extra piece, this is the magic piece that enforces a speed limit in relativity that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. There's no such speed limit in um, classical space-time. You could, you could, in principle, go as fast as you like. You could go 10 times the speed of light, 100 times the speed of light, a million times the speed of light, in principle. In relativity, you cannot go faster than the speed of light. You can go 99% of the speed of light, 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, and so on, but never, never as fast or faster than the speed of light. And it's all done by this little piece here. It's magic. Let me show you how it works. Um, I've got an example, actually I've got two examples here uh, that we're going to work through where we're first going to look at the Galilean classical transformation of velocities from one frame to another frame and then we're going to look at the, what we call the Lorentzian relativistic transforms from one frame to another frame. So we're going to do that. Um, so in, in this particular problem, what are we told? Austin Powers is traveling left to right at 80% uh, of the speed of uh, of light relative to the Earth reference frame. Here's Austin. Uh, Dr. Evil is traveling left to right at 90% of the speed of light with respect to the Earth reference frame. Here's, here's Dr. Evil. What speed, what speed does Austin see Dr. Evil moving at? Okay, this, this is just like the pedestrian reference frame, truck reference frame, and birdie example. Uh, and it's just how do you transform motion from one reference frame to another reference frame? We know Dr. Evil's motion in the Earth reference frame. We want to figure out Dr. Evil's motion in Austin Powers reference frame. So we're going to do this with our transformations. Firstly, with our classical Galilean transformations, then with our relativistic uh, Lorentzian transformations. OK, so and for the Galilean transformations, I'm just going to use this equation here. So Vx, this is, Vx is the motion of Dr. Evil in the Earth reference frame, in this blue reference frame here. So that's the Vx. VR is the uh, motion of Austin Powers reference frame with respect to the Earth reference frame. So uh, he was moving at 80% of the speed of light with respect to the Earth reference frame. Vx prime then is the velocity that the that doc, sorry, Austin Powers sees Dr. Evil moving at with respect to his reference frame, the Austin Powers reference frame. And so we can just use this equation here. So in this equation here, in, in this example here, uh, Dr. Evil is the birdie. Uh, the Earth reference frame is the pedestrian reference frame. And Austin Powell's reference frame is the equivalent of the truck reference frame. This is how this is working. So we're going to plug in um, Dr. Evil's speed in the Earth reference frame. That's 90% of the speed of light. We're going to plug in um, uh, Austin Powers speed in the Earth reference frame. That's 80% of the speed of light. And we're going to subtract 90% from 80% of the speed of light. And we get 10% of the speed of light. And that would be common sense. You know, if Delta Evil's racing towards the left at 90% of the speed of light, and Austin Powers is racing towards the, sorry, the right uh, at 80% of the speed of light, then obviously common sense tells you that um, Austin will see Dr. Evil 
moving ahead of him at 10% of the speed of light. I hope, hope that's common sense. But those speeds, those speeds were of order approaching the speed of light. So for those speeds, unlike everyday speeds, we can't use Galilean transformations. They wouldn't work. They don't work. Let's, we've got to use the Lorentz transformations, the relativistic transformations for these velocities. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, uh, same slide as last slide. The only thing I'm changing is that I'm going to use a different formula, this formula here, the new formula for relativistic transformations of velocities. Remember the, the first piece of it that I'm cleverly circling with the laser pointer? That's just the Galilean piece. And then the, the extra source is the fact that I'm going to divide by 1 minus this product of two velocities divided by c squared, which is the product of two velocities. Okay, so let's, let's now plug in the number, rem, num, numbers. Remember, uh, Dr. Evil's going towards the right, 90% of the speed of light. Austin's going towards the uh, right with 80% of the speed of light. We want to know how fast Austin sees in Austin's frame Dr. Evil moving. That's the question. That's what we want to know Vx prime. Um, we've got to plug in uh, Dr. Evil's motion in the Earth's reference frame. So we've got to plug in Vx. We've got to plug in Austin's motion in the Earth reference frame. That's the VR. So we plug in these numbers. In the numerator, we get that same factor of 90% of the speed of light minus 80% of the speed of light. That's going to be 10% of the speed of light. But now we're dividing by 1 minus something that isn't tiny. It's, it's um, 0.9 for the 90% of speed of light that Dr. Evil's moving at times 0.8 for the 80% of the speed of light for the, the, the Austin's traveling at. The, all the C squareds cancel out here. When I plug in 90% of the speed of light, 80% of the speed of light, the speed of lights can't cancel out with the c speed of lights in the squared in the de denominator here. And you end up with 30%, 36% of the speed of light. That's quite different from 10% of the speed of light. So in, in relativity, um, Austin doesn't see uh, Dr. Evil heading away from him at 10% of the speed of light. He seems heading away from him much faster, 33.6 times faster at 36% of the speed of light. So that's an amazing feature. Here's perhaps an even more amazing example. What I'm going to do in this example, again, I've just got two slides, one of the classical transformation, one of the Lorentzian relativistic transformation. Um, it's exactly the same type of problem as the, um, the, the pedestrian and the truck and the birdie or uh, Dr. Evil and uh, Austin Powers and, and the Earth. Um, but now I've replaced uh, Dr. Evil with flashlight. And we're shining the flashlight towards the right. And so the, the flashlight's light travels towards the right at the speed of light, rather than 90% of the speed of light. And our question is going to be, um, well, the, the, the flashlight light is traveling at 90% uh, at 100% uh, of the speed of light, the speed of light from the reference, reference frame. Uh, what does, what velocity does Austin, Austin see this? the light travel at in his reference frame. So if we were to use the classical Galilean velocity transformation, it's just this common sense formula here, what would we get? Well, um, we would be plugging in the speed of light in the Earth reference frame. That's the blue Vx here, and that's, that's the speed of light. We'd be plugging in Austin's motion in the Earth reference frame. That's 80% of the speed of light. So we plug in 0.8c here. And then when we do the calculation, we'd have 1c minus 0.8c, which will give us 0.2c. And so, um, you know, it's common sense, right, that Austin would see um, the light, if he's move it, moving towards the right 80% of the speed of light, he'd see the light ray that's traveling towards the right 100% uh, of the speed of light, he'd see it moving at 20% of the speed of light. Common sense. Maybe common sense, but it's not right. Um, we've got to use these velocities again. 
with a flashlight in Austin and the Earth. Th these are uh, velocities that are not negligible compared to the speed of light. They're order of the speed of light. They're close to the speed of light. So we better use the relativistic transformation between the light ray speed as seen from the Earth reference frame, where I am, and the light ray speed as seen from Austin Powers' reference frame in his moving spaceship. So we've got to use this equation here. Again, the first piece of it is simply the Galilean transformation, but the extra source is dividing by this factor 1 minus something that is negligible at everyday velocities, but substantial at um, velocities approaching the speed of light. So in the numerator, I've again got the speed of light minus 80% of the speed of light. So the numerator is going to give me 2 tenths of the speed of light. But in the denominator, I got 1 minus, now what's the magic number here? It's going to be um, the product of um, the speed of the light ray in the Earth reference frame. So that's C times Austin's speed in the Earth reference frame. That's 0.8 times C. So I'm going to get a factor of 1 times 0.8. Uh, so I'm actually also going to get, get 0.2. I not only get it in the numerator, but I'm going to get it in the denominator. So the ratio of the two is going to come out to be 1. So they both see, they both see the light ray traveling at the speed of light. It, it seems unimaginable that, that that could be the case. But they, they both, in relativity, they both see that light ray traveling at the speed of light. And maybe that, maybe if you think about it, last class, well, we, we built the whole of relativity on that fact. So we better reproduce that fact. We did reproduce that fact. So that's an amazing thing about relativity and how, how velocity is at. Um, this transformation, not only does it enforce so one thing it does is it enforces that everybody sees the, uh, the speed of light as being 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Whatever reference frame you're in, it enforces that. So it's, it's really amazing and beautiful, that equation, how it enforces that. It also enforces the fact that you can't go faster than the speed of light. You can try playing around with this equation, but you can n never, never make a speed that's faster than the speed of light. We could have Austin Power traveling 80% of the speed to, of the light to, speed of light towards the left instead of towards the right. You'd then think he'd see the, the light rays traveling at faster than the speed of light, but he wouldn't. So it, 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 it puts speed limit, a speed limit on everything, including light. OK. Take a breath. Um, that, was, that was how you add velocities, and that was how you reproduce the fact that the speed of light is the same for everybody, and um, how there's a, a speed limit, a relativistic speed limit on speeds. Now I want to talk about laws of motion. Uh, laws of motion in relativity compares to laws of motion in classical space-time. Okay, so I've got two slides here, which is to set it up, which kind of, um, I made, made this up. I made up a little play. Um, it's an imagined con a conversation between um, Einstein and, and Newton, the sort of um, parents of classical space-time and uh, relativistic space-time. Of course, they weren't alive at the same time, so it's not a real thing. We know that. Um, OK, but let's, so the first slide is, is Newton complaining, because he, he was a well-known complainer. Um, and then we've got um, uh, Einstein replying. He's a, actually a well-known accommodator, avoidant um, accommodator. Um, OK, what, what does Newton say? Uh, I guess he's saying something like, um, my, my laws of motion, he's very proud of them, my laws of motion describe how forces change the motion of objects. That's what the laws of motion do. Uh, my laws of motion describe how forces, what the, the way they work is that they transfer energy and they transfer momentum. But the interesting thing about energy and momentum is that energy is conserved and momentum is conserved. So that's a, a detail about how forces work. His forces and energy and momentum acted in a in a, in a sort of space-time, acted on a space-time stage, a sort of space-time background, 
where um, time intervals were absolute. Everyone would agree on the interval between two events. And spatial intervals, um, i.e. lengths, were uh, invariant too, absolute. Everybody would agree on the length of something. So his, his laws of motion, his ideas of energy and momentum, all as on a stage of um, absolute time intervals, absolute spatial distances. And so he's worried now. He's concerned now what's going to happen to you know, his, his, his proudest product, his laws of motion, and his ideas of energy and momentum. So what's going to go on? Okay, so uh, Einstein's going to try, um, uh, um, well, he's going to validate him. Uh, he's, he, he's, he's fine that he has those concerns, but he's going to tell him not to worry about it. So I'm, I, Einstein's going to, um, uh, what's, what, what's Einstein going to say? I've actually forgotten what he was going to say. Uh, he, he points out that um, this is the validation bit. Uh, Newton's right, right? Newton's right that um, in classical space-time, uh, time intervals are absolute, and lengths of objects, they're absolute, and that's, that's, um, that's going to break down in relativity, that uh, time intervals, uh, lengths are um, relative, relative to your frame of reference. Uh, what, another thing that's going to break down in, in, in classical space-time, you can go any speed you like, in principle. In r relativistic space-time, there's a, a limit on the speed you can go. You can't go faster than the speed of light. So uh, that's first, he's, he's like a therapist. He's validating uh, Newton's uh, uh, concerns or worries. Um, but then he's going to go on and say, don't worry. Um, although space and time have been ordered, and they've been dramatically ordered, the concepts of energy and momentum and forces transferring energy and momentum, that still works in relativity. And also, the foundation that energy is a conserved quantity and that momentum is a conserved quantity, that also still works in, in, in relat relativistic space-time, like it works in classical space-time. Uh, all we've got to do is modify our definitions of energy and momentum for our relativistic space-time, from our definitions of energy and momentum in our everyday classical space-time. And not surprisingly, the modifications that we're going to make, what got involved in the modifications we made for space and time with time dilation, length, contraction, it was the Lorentz factor. When we modify energy and momentum, we're going to get the Lorentz factor coming to join the party to modify the meanings of energy and momentum and how they work. Okay. So I'm going to start with the modification uh, to momentum. It's, it's a simpler one. Um, it's a simpler one in terms of an equation. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the modification for energy. It's a bit more complicated uh, one in terms of uh, the equations. So over on this slide, I've got classical momentum on the left-hand side, and a, 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 an equation for it and a description of it. And I've got relativistic momentum on the right-hand side, an equation for it and a, and a description related to it. Uh, let's just quickly go through the classical one, and then we'll point out the differences for the relativistic one. Okay, so classical momentum, we all remember this from um, Physics 211. M momentum P equals the product of the, the mass of an object and the velocity of the object. It's MV. That's the definition of momentum. Um, the, it's a quantity that gets transferred when forces act. When forces act, they tr in general transfer momentum between the objects uh, uh, that are interacting with the, the, with the, through a force. Uh, momentum overall though, although these objects may exchange some momentum, if two billiard balls collide, they might exchange some momentum, overall the total momentum of the system, of the billiard ball system is going to be conserved, so it has that very important property. And so that's, um, that's classical momentum. 
What about relativistic momentum? Um, well, um, in relativity, the, the momentum, rather than it being uh, the product of mass and velocity, is simply the product of mass, velocity, and the Lorentz factor. That's the only difference. So that's the only change. And it, if you think about that, the Lorentz factor, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, the Lorentz factor for everyday speeds is just 1. So in our everyday world, uh, our Lorentz, right, we all have Lorentz. Right, right now, I've got a Lorentz factor. You want to know what it is? It's 1. Um, everyday world, no, no matter whether in a car or a plane or whatever, uh, our Lorentz factor is 1. And so, you know, in the everyday world, th these two equations are exactly the same. It's only when you um, approach the speed of light, get of order of the speed of light, and not negligible to the speed of light, then um, this equation differs from this equation. So this is the modification. So that probably makes Newton happy that uh, his, in his everyday world, there's no, no change. Um, all these ideas about uh, forces transferring momentum when two relativistic billiard balls or two classical billiard balls um, interact or collide, that all still holds. Momentum gets transferred. It's just the momentum that's being transferred relativistically is gamma mv rather than mv. Um, the idea that overall the momentum is conserved when two classical billiard balls collide or two relativistic billiard balls collide, that, that still holds. That all holds too. It's just that the quantity that's conserved uh, relativistically is the sum of the gamma mvs of the colliding objects rather than the sum of just the mvs of the colliding objects. And so that's how we, um, that's how we fix up momentum. It's as simple, straightforward as that. Sounds simple and straightforward, but let me show you a plot that has some of the consequences of multiplying mv by the Lorentz factor, of going from p equals mv to p equals gamma mv. That's what this slide is about. It's comparing in green, uh, this is not green, um, blue, classical momentum, p equals mv, with in red, relativistic momentum, p equals gamma mv. So it's a comparison of those. Um, it's a comparison through this plot or this graph or this picture here. Horizontally, I've got velocity. Vertically, I've got momentum. Obviously, you know, to have momentum, you've got to move. So uh, momentum is a reflection of the velocity, um, uh, but it also depends on the, the mass of the moving object. So I'm plotting the momentum one way of depicting motion versus velocity, the, another way of thinking about motion that we've been, been discussing already. So we got velocity horizontally, we got momentum vertically. Over here on the far left, that's, that's everyday velocities. So velocities are negligible compared to the speed of light. Over, over here on the far right, this is the, the speed of light. This is a, the speed limit in relativity. It's not a speed limit in um, in, in classical space-time. And then the blue line is the classical momentum equation, p equals mv, and the red line is the relativistic momentum equation, um, p equals gamma nv. Uh, you see on this graph some interesting features. Down here. Down, we're all down here, right? We're all down here, crushed down in this little corner. In that little corner, um, uh, gamma mv and mv are exactly the same because, essentially exactly the same, because the gamma is 1. The Lorentz factors of all of us in all of the motion will ever do is, is 1. Close, so close to 1, it's 1. And so the, the, the relativistic and classical momenta are the same down here. But they depart from each other when you go to velocities that are approaching or of order the speed the speed of light. And so that's what you see here. You know, the red curve is different from the, um, from the blue curve. And you see a very important difference here. As you increase the velocity, the relativistic momentum gets bigger than the classical momentum. That's because the gamma factor gets bigger than 1. And actually, as you think about the gamma factor, imagine it now. I can do this. Imagine 1 over the square root of, of 1 minus v 
v squared over c squared. If you start making v squared over c squared approach 1, you're going to get something that is 1 minus something that's nearly 1 in the denominator, which makes something really big, makes gamma really big. Gamma goes towards, Lorentz factor goes towards infinity for speeds approaching the speed of light. If gamma goes towards infinity for speeds approaching the speed of light, then the momentum, relativistic momentum, will go towards infinity for speeds approaching the speed of light. And that's the trend you're seeing here. You can't get faster than the speed of light in relativity. One explanation is you would need more than infinite momentum because at the speed of light, an object, you, I, or anything, would have infinite momentum. And we could never give something with forces, uh, forces, finite forces, something infinite momentum. And so that's the curve of relativistic momentum. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger um, uh, at high speeds where the speed is barely changing, but the momentum is growing and growing. Classical momentum, on the other hand, doesn't care about the speed of light. Doesn't know, it doesn't even know about the speed of light, classical momentum. Um, and you know, classical momentum formula could get bigger and bigger and bigger the momentum would get bigger in proportion to the speed getting bigger. Okay. Question. Quiz question. <clears throat> this is about speed and momentum in, in relativity. Okay, so this asks you to think about speed and momentum in relativity. And it asks you, is there a limit on speed or not? Is there a limit on momentum or not? And so there's obviously, with two quantities, limit or not, there's four combinations. They both have limits, they both don't have limits in the, you know, one does, one doesn't cases. So I'll give you a... Um, uh, a couple of minutes to think about that and then we'll move on to energy. Okay, so I'll get started again. Just to answer this, in relativity, there is a limit on speed. You can't go faster than the speed of light. There's no such limit in classical space-time. In relativity, there is no limit on momentum. You can always increase the momentum by pushing some more, by exerting some more force. There's no limit on momentum. It can get larger and larger and larger and infinitely large. Let's move from momentum in relativity to energy in relativity. Again, that the idea of energy still applies in relativity. The idea of energy conservation still applies in relativity. We just got to modify our notions of energy. 
Uh, to do that, I wanna, I've got three slides here um, about what is mass, because our, our changes in notions of energy are related to what is mass. And there's different levels of answering the question, what is mass, depending on whether you're in kindergarten, basically, or you're in, um, uh, I, I don't know, middle school, or, uh, or, what, or whatever. I, that's, there's different levels of answering this. I don't know where, where I'm going with that. OK, so what is mass? Well, well, here's something with a very large mass, an elephant. And here's something with a comparatively small mass, a, a mouse. Um, uh, one answer to what is mass is that mass is a measure of the kind of the amount of quantity, material, substance that you have. So that, that's, that's one answer. And um, you know, I might tell a kindergartner that that's what, what, what mass is. It's a, it's a measure of how much stuff you have, how much substance, how much matter, uh, how much material you, you have. Well, another answer came from Newton. Isaac, Isaac Newton answered the question, what is mass? And one answer to the question, what is mass, is that mass is a measure of inertia. It's a measure of your reluctance or resistance to having your motion changed. If you have more mass, you have more resistance, reluctance to having your motion changed. It's harder to change your, your movement, your motion with a force. If you have less mass, you have less reluctance, resistance to having your motion changed. Uh, it's easier with a force to change your motion. That's all embodied in Newton's second law, F equals ma. So that's another answer to what is mass. The third answer, which is what we're going to meet, is from Albert Einstein. And his answer is that mass is a brand of energy. It's a form of energy. You know, like kinetic energy, moving energy. That's a form of energy, a brand, brand of energy. Like um, uh, solar energy. That's a form of energy, a brand of energy. A chemical energy in a battery. That's a form of energy, a, a, a brand of energy. Well, mass is just a, another form of energy, or a brand of energy. And E equals mc squared is the relationship between you know, mass and energy. Like uh, you know, 1 half mv squared is the motion between motion and energy. So that's another way of thinking about energy. And that's that discovery, that insight, came about through relativity and relativistic space-time. OK, so I, we, we modified the equation for momentum so that it applies uh, at relativistic velocities. We changed mv to gamma mv. We've got to modify our equation, say, for um, energy, kinetic energy, so that it applies at high speeds, relativistic <coughs> speeds. And that's what I've written down here in this humongous equation upstairs here. It looks very imposing, I think. Uh, but let's just walk our way through it. So this in a, is an equation for the total energy, I just wrote it as E, of, say, a, a moving particle, a moving object. It might be the moving elephant, or it might be the moving uh, mouse. It's the um, total energy of the moving elephant, the moving mouse, or the moving particle, or whatever. It says that the total energy of the moving elephant, moving mouse, is given by gamma, that's Lorentz factor, mc squared. That's the total energy. So look, we're seeing gamma's, you know, gamma just keeps cropping up when you get into relativity, doesn't it? You can't get away from it in relativity. Every, every equation in relativity, you're going to get a gamma floating around. Uh, and that's how we're going to modify our energies in, in relativity compared to classical physics where there's, there's, there's no gammas. So this is the total energy of the moving elephant or the moving mouse. Um, that total energy of the moving elephant or the moving mouse, can, you can break it up into two pieces, two parts, two components. One is 
kinetic energy, the familiar kinetic energy associated with motion. The, the other one is the new bit. It's what we call rest energy. It's the energy associated with mass or material or matter. And so here in this, this part of the equation, I'm just saying that it's often fruitful, useful, to think about, about this total energy of the elephant or the mouse as being made up of two pieces, one specifically associated with the motion, another one specifically associated with the material, the matter. Um, the rest energy is mc squared. So that's the famous E equals mc squared. It's rest energy equals mc squared. And the kinetic energy, it, relativistically, it also involves the Lorentz factor, is gamma minus 1 times mc squared. So here's the rest energy, the new brand of energy. This is the new one. Uh, and here's our old familiar one. It's the kinetic energy. But it's written in a, it doesn't look like 1 half mv squared, does it? It turns out, right, that if you think of this equation in the limit where the speeds are small compared to the speed of light, so where V over C is much smaller, that's, that's our everyday world. In this, this limit of everyday speeds, this quantity here, which looks kind of mysterious, I think, gamma minus 1 times n v squared, that quantity actually, if v is much smaller than c, turns into, miraculously perhaps, 1 half mv squared. Somehow, the c's in here, gamma minus 1, there's a speed of light in there, the c's here, there's a square of speed of light here, they cancel out when v is smaller than, much, much smaller than c, and it does just become a half mv squared. So um, th this equation here, just like momentum, uh, everyday gamma mv, everyday speeds became just regular old classical Newtonian momentum, then this equation here, at everyday speeds, becomes just regular old kinetic energy, one half mv squared. So uh, uh, we're not fiddling with um, equations of energy, kinetic energy at low speeds. I, I wrote it down here. This may, may crop up uh, in a homework problem. Um, here, I'm writing the energy of the elephant or the energy of the mouse in terms of gammas, which means I'm writing the energy of the elephant or the mouse really in terms of Vs, their speeds, because in gamma is a V. You can also write the energy in terms of momentum rather than in terms of velocity v. You can do it classically. This is, an, instead of, this is equivalent to 1 half mv squared, but it's just in terms of the momentum. Uh, you can do it relativistically. This is just like this, this e squared equals this guy squared, but I've written it in terms of momentum. So I'm just showing that you, these pair of equations, I think this comes up in the homework, you can not only write the um, uh, energy uh, in terms of uh, velocities or Lorentz factors, you can write the energy in terms of the relativistic momentum or classically the class classical momentum. Okay, um, just to make a point about these two types of energy. So now we've got these two brands of energy associated with the moving mouse and the moving elephant. Um, there's one a familiar type of energy which is associated with their motion, the kinetic energy of the mouse and the elephant, and then there's this new type that's associated with their matter, the material, the substance. Uh, that's the rest energy of the mouse, or, or rest energy of the elephant. Here, in this little example, I'm imagining that our little old mouse down here is running away from the elephant at 10 miles an hour. Okay, I, So the mouse is running at 10 miles an hour, and I'm asking the question now, well, how much energy does that correspond to the mouse having? How much um, kinetic energy associated with the mouse's motion? How much mass energy associated with the mouse's mass? So I'm going to calculate those two contributions to the energy. Uh, and I did it. I, I did it using, I could use uh, these equations upstairs here. 
or you know, for the um, kinetic energy, because the mass is moving slowly, I could use one half mv squared. But in either case, I calculated the kinetic energy is half a joule. Okay, it's, the mass isn't very heavy. Um, it's 50 grams, 0 0.05 kilograms. It's not moving very fast, 10 miles an hour. That's about five meters per second. If you calculate the um, number of joules of energy of the mouse running, uh, that speed is it's only half a joule. If you calculate the rest energy of the mouse, rest energy of the mouse is going to be E equals mc squared. So mass is 0 0.05 kilograms times c squared. C is a big number. C is um, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We're squaring that big number. Uh, we're going to get, um, I'll do it in my head, 9 times 10 to the 16 meters squared per second squared. That's a massive number that we're multiplying the, um, the, the mass of the mouse by to get the rest energy is about uh, uh, 5 times 10 to the 15 joules. So if we could really see the energy of the running mouse, we would really see that its energy associated with motion is tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a joule. Its energy associated with its mass is enormous, 10 to the 15 joules. The, the secret of E equals mc squared is that small amounts of mass, like the mass of a mouse, are actually massive, absolutely massive stores of energy. Absolutely massive resources of energy. Okay, let's take a little break. Um, I thought I'd have, have Albert Einstein come to class. Because um, I thought he, you know, e equals mc squared floats around everywhere. Um, let's have him explain it. If I can get it. Oh, well, that's the slide, not the video. <laughs> Duh. Do we think that mass and energy are good, are but different manifestations of the same thing? A somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average mind. Furthermore, the equation E is equal mc squared in which energy is set equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy and vice versa. The mass and energy were in fact equivalent according to the formula mentioned before. This was demonstrated by Kokra and Walton in 1932, experimentally. Okay. So he said some very important points there. Mass, energy are equivalent. That was one point he made. Mass is a form of energy, a brand of energy. Another point is that uh, a small amount of mass, he said, is equivalent to an absolutely huge amount of energy because you multiply the mass by c squared. And the last thing he said, if you caught it, was this, this is not just some in invention. It was then measured in the lab. Co he mentioned Cockcroft and Walton, two famous nuclear scientists. They measured the equivalence of mass and energy in the lab. They turned mass into energy in the lab and verified e equals mc squared. So it, it is real. OK. Where am I going? Let's look at an example or two. In, in this question here, we're asked to think about a relativistic proton, a high-speed proton. This is a overhead view of a lab a, a, a national lab near Chicago. It's a Fermilab near Chicago. Um, this ring here is a circular particle accelerator. This is Fermilab. It was called the Tevatron. Of course, not, not working right now. <laughs> um, uh, and it would accelerate protons around the ring and collide the protons that go around the ring. And it would accelerate protons so that their uh, total energy We've been talking about that, is 
400 times their rest energy. We've been talking about that. It's very interesting because when we talked about the mouse and the elephant, we said that their, um, their rest energies were way, way, way bigger than their kinetic energies, no matter how fa fast the mouse or the elephant ran. This is a reverse situation. In the accelerator with subatomic particles, protons, they've actually got the um, total energy to be much, of the proton to be much greater than the rest energy of the proton. It's 400 times greater. We're going to figure out what the rest energy is, what the total energy is, and what the kinetic energy is of our, our proton. Um, I made a comment here. This is a comment about the units that we're going to use for energy and mass. Okay, so in, in physics 211, when we were talking about mass and energy, we would use kilograms and joules. Those are the things we've been working with. We've got to know and love them. Um, we're very familiar with them because they're everyday numbers in our everyday world. Um, when we talk about subatomic particles, we're not going to use joules and kilograms. It becomes extraordinarily inconvenient. I'd make mistakes all over the place. Uh, so we're going to use different units. We're going to use for mass electron volts over c squared, EV over c squared. That's a, another unit of mass. It looks clumsy, but it's handier for subatomic particles. Uh, and for energy, we're going to use electron volts, EV. Again, it looks a bit clumsier, but it's very handy for subatomic particles. Um, uh, one electron volt is this tiny fraction of a joule, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Uh, one uh, electron volt of a c squared, the unit of mass, is this tiny fraction of a mass, 1.8 uh, times 10 to the minus 36 kilograms. Finally, one piece of information we're going to use is what is the mass of a proton? Well, um, the mass of a proton is a very small fraction of a kilogram. It's 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Uh, so that's one way we could express the mass. Uh, we'll see that a handier way is these um, units of EV over C squared. Here it is. Here is the mass, 938 million electron volts over C squared. So that's the way we're going to work with the mass. I put down here another mass unit that's used in, uh, you know this from chemistry, uh, atomic mass units. Um, you could also write the mass of a proton in atomic mass units. This is its value in atomic mass units. It's just over one atomic mass unit. Okay, so let's work this out. So here we go with the document camera. And I've, I've started myself off by writing, of course I would do this on an exam, I, or you know, if I was solving the homework at home. Um, I would write down what I'm told in the problem. I would sort of um, digest the words of the problem and um, then write down exactly the information I was given. Uh, the mass of the proton, we said, is 938 MeV over C squared, these units of mass. And we were also told that the, um, rest, the total energy is 400 times the rest energy. If you remember back to the energy equations, E, the total energy, was gamma MC squared. MC squared is the rest energy. So we're told, actually, when you're told that the total energy is 400 times the rest energy, you've been told that gamma in E equals gamma MC squared is 400. It is the ratio of the total energy, I wrote that TE here, to, to the rest energy, wrote that RE here. So we're told both those pieces of information. Uh, so let's find out what the rest energy is. So this is just mass energy equivalence. This is that one of those points Albert was telling us about mass and energy equivalent. This is just an example of that, that the equivalent energy associated with a, a certain mass is mc squared. And so all I've got to do is take my mass of a proton, MEV, 938 MeV over c squared, and multiply it by c squared. This is the reason why these two units are so great. Uh, the c squares in the numerator and denominator cancel out, so the mass, so the energy, the equivalent energy of a proton is 938 million electron volts. So that, that became easy. 
You don't want to do that in kilograms and joules. Uh, total energy. What's the total energy of our, our, our proton? Well, the total energy of the proton, that was gamma mc squared. Gamma, the Lorentz factor, we were told, we were sort of told in a kind of underhanded, tricky way. We were told that the total energy was 400 times the rest energy. That's telling you gamma. Gamma is 400. So we've just got to multiply gamma of 400 by mc squared. That is the rest energy. So that's 938 MeV. And um, that comes out to be, obviously I've worked it out ahead of time, 3.75 times 10 to the 5 MeV. So that's the uh, total energy. Obviously way bigger than the rest energy. Quite different from the elephant and the mouse. Finally, kinetic energy. Well, the total energy is the sum of the rest energy associated with mass and the kinetic energy associated with motion. The kinetic energy, there, so um, Te equals Re, rest energy, plus Ke, which means that Ke, kinetic energy, is equal to the total energy less the, the amount that's used for the, mass energy, the, the rest energy. So um, this is going to be Te minus Re. Everybody understood that until I described it, probably. Um, <laughs> which is typical. Um, all I've got to do is subtract the two previous energies from one another. I know the total energy is 3.75 times 10 to the 5 MeV. I know the rest energy is 938 MeV. Um, this 938 is about 1,000 MeV, 1 times 10 to the 3 MeV. So I can see that this subtraction is going to come out to be not 3.75, but 3.74 times 10 to the 3 MeV. And so we figured out the rest energy, the kinetic energy, the um, total energy of our proton, knowing the gamma factor for the proton, knowing that one piece of information, which is related to the speed of the proton. Now you could also calculate the speed, if you like, for the gamma factor of 400. Gamma factor of 400 means it's really, really close to the speed of light. I think if you do it, you'll, get a, you'll find that it's 99.9999% um, the speed of light. In this accelerator, at this lab, in Chicago, near Chicago, they are accelerating protons to 99.9999% of the speed of light. Quite amazing. Okay. E equals mc squared tells us a lot about how all sorts of things work. And I'm going to tell you a, a little bit in this last example here, probably won't have much time, about how nuclear power works. So one thing about relativity is that before relativity, um, in science, we had a law for the conservation of mass. You couldn't destroy or create mass. Mass was a conserved thing. We had a law for the conservation of energy. You couldn't create or destroy energy. It was a conserved quantity. After, re after relativity, those two things melt together. They dissolve together because mass is just a form of energy. So it's really just one conservation law of energy in which mass energy, like kinetic energy, is a brand of energy. So um, if, if think, of, think of chemistry. You've got, um, gosh, can't, personally can't, um, but you've got exothermic chemical reactions, you've got endothermic chemical reactions, reactions that um, uh, release energy or absorb energy. You know, when a piece of metal, iron, rusts, that's a, that's a, um, uh, that's a, a reaction that releases some energy, exothermic energy. Um, uh, when you um, uh, free, freeze water into ice, again, that's a reaction. And the energy, if you melt it or, or, or freeze it, you get energy released or uh, absorbed. So we can think of uh, reactions in terms of absorbing and releasing energy. When you absorb or release energy, there's a corresponding change in the mass. 
there's a different mass between the same amount of water molecules and the same amount of uh, uh, ice molecules. Uh, there's um, any chemical reaction that occurs, there's either if you release energy, or absorb energy, that means there's a change in mass of the objects, the, the, the chemicals involved in the reaction. And that's how nuclear power works. So in, in um, oh, I've only got one slide, sorry. Um, in nuclear power, the way it works is, the typical way it works is we take uranium, which is a very heavy nucleus, and we sm split it into smaller parts. If you add up the mass of the um, uranium and the neutrons that it reacts with, and you compare that with the mass of the uh, lighter nuclei that it was broken into, and the neutrons that come out of the reaction, you discover that the mass that you start with is bigger than the mass that you end up with. That energy gets released. And compared to chemical reactions like rusting iron or something like that, the amount of energy that's released in splitting up uranium is enormous. So nuclear power is a huge, huge, huge source of energy. And it's a classic example of turning you know, rest energy into uh, kinetic energy so we can generate electricity for our electrical lives. Let me just show you. An example of a reaction in a nuclear reaction reactor. So this is a reactor that basically burns uranium into lighter nuclei through a chain reaction. A chain reaction is you put in a neutron to burn a, a, a uranium nucleus. It splits up, but it releases a couple of neutrons. So it can then burn a couple more. And those couple more that get burnt into lighter nuclei, they each release pairs of neutrons, and so you can burn even more. And so you can burn through the uranium in this chain reaction. This is the chain reaction. This is an isotope of uranium, uranium-235. This is a mistake. It should be five. Um, and this is what starts the chain. Here comes a neutron. It gets absorbed, and that splits the uranium into two lighter nuclei. And here's uh, examples, barium and krypton. Is this? I don't know any chemistry. Realize I don't know what these guys are. Uh, <laughs> oops. Um, anyway, splits, splits uranium into two, two parts. It could be lots of different, there's lots of ways of splitting it up. It's not just um, these, these two guys. Um, but you notice also more neutrons come out. So you actually gained a couple of neutrons. You put one in, but you got three out. Um, so you can use those two that came out to burn another couple of uranium nuclei. And then you, you'll get four more out. So you can burn four more uranium nuclei, and you're off to the races, right? Burning all through all the uranium in your, in your rod of uranium or whatever you got. Um, so this is how it all works. And this is how we generate uh, electrical power from nuclear power. And um, here's the calculation. So I just want to show you this to end up with in these last couple of minutes. This is the reaction that we just talked about. This is a, called a nuclear fission reaction. And um, it's the reaction in which this heavy parent nucleus, the uranium, is, is broken into two lighter nuclei. Barium and, is it krypton? I have no idea. It must be. Uh, by uh, absorbing a neutron and then actually releasing three more neutrons so the chain reaction can go ahead. You can figure out the energy that's released in this exothermic reaction by taking the difference between E equals mc squared for the initial masses over here on the left and E equals mc squared for the final masses over here on the right. And so I thought, I thought, I was doing this last night, I thought to myself, I'm going to figure this out. How much, when I burn one uranium nucleus, how much will I get out? Um, well, I, I need to plug in the masses of the uranium and the neutron in the initial state and then the barium, the krypton, and the three neutrons in the final state. So I'm going to plug them all in. I got plus signs for the initial nuclei and I got minus signs for the final nuclei. The difference is going to be the 
This is exothermic reaction. It's the kinetic energy release. So I plugged in all the numbers. I realized here you've got to plug in the numbers with many digits. Because this is a problem where you're taking the difference of two very large numbers that are really quite similar, and you want to know the difference. 